thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, my name's Tammy, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Partial, which is an art marketplace platform showcasing art by emerging and diverse artists from all across Canada. Um, on behalf of everyone here um, at Partial and Imprimo and Carfac, we're really glad to be able to gather everyone here today at the beginning of the new year and share this conversation together. Now, artists imagine and create work all across this beautiful country we call Canada, land that Indigenous peoples have stewarded for 15,000 years and continue to do so today. As organizations founded by settlers on traditional Indigenous lands, to speak of Canadian art calls on our commitment to decolonize past structures in the arts sector, celebrate Indigenous peoples' history and diversity, and create space for Indigenous creators to create their art and culture. Today, we have speakers speakers tuning in from different parts of Canada, um, from the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, and also calling in from the traditional unceded territory of the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, and Peskutu Muktati peoples. I'll now pass it back to JD, CEO of Imprimo, and we can get our conversation started. Amazing. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, a little bit about the event. So we've introduced recently our partnership with Partial, which we're really excited about. Uh, and we've been flooded with questions ever since, you know, what is Partial? How do I sell my work online? Uh, and so on. So quite excited today uh, to, to do this event with Partial. The event today will touch on a few things. We'll touch on some of these, some of the lessons that we've learned as a company building in Primo on, on what, what is the best approach or what are some you know, bad, some some of the best ways to increase your the opportunities and increase your presence online and drive engagement. And we'll also hear from from Partial on some of the some of the lessons that they've learned building Partial on you know uh, different ideas on selling on selling your work online, tricks and tips and so on. As well as hear from a few of our speakers on how they went about building their online presence, what worked, what didn't work, uh, as well as kind of what what was their experience um, with Partial. Uh, so we'll also give you a quick uh, overview of our platform on Imprimo. We'll give you some an overview of the platform on um, Partial and answer all your questions at the end. So with that, we'll go into our first conversation, which is going to be with our artists. We have April Pine here and Lynn's. Man, I'm sorry if I don't say that right. I think it's Mayo. I don't know if it was my Joe or Mayo. You're, you're, on, you're on mute, Lens. Uh, but I'd like to welcome the, the, the two of them, as well as Tammy, the CEO of Partial, to join us for a conversation. Lens, you're still on mute. All right. Perfect. So with that, what I would like to do is uh, I'd like to start by giving a chance to, uh, we heard a little bit from Tammy, uh, give a chance to 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 uh, Linz to introduce herself as an artist, and then we will go with April. And while uh, Linz is introducing herself, I'll show a little bit around her profile in Primo so you can get a little bit more familiar with her as an artist and with her work. Thanks so much, JD. I'm so happy to be here today. This is awesome. Um, so I am Linz Mio, and I am an abstract painter. Um, I uh, did not start out as a painter. I started out more as a graphic designer. I worked in publications. I worked in advertising. Um, I went into creative direction. I did a lot of sort of art adjacent activities for many, many years. And then I kind of got older and said, wow, what do I really want to do? Um, and I really wanted to paint and I just wanted to take some time with that and, and see what could come of that. Um, so I started painting professionally, I guess about five years ago. Of course, it doesn't feel like five years ago with the pandemic and all that. Um, and my initial feeling was just like, how do I do this? And I literally went to every show that I could think of. And I went and I asked artists that I liked and I said, how does one do this? Um, and I actually met Tammy at one of those very early shows and um, got to know a little bit about Partial and was just like, okay, so there are avenues that you can do this. Like I'm a mom, I'm busy. I don't have all the time in the world. I can't be at every show. I can't go to every show. I can't pay thousands of dollars to do the shows every time or to travel to different places and be away from my family. So. For me, it was just a really natural transition to go online, um, but at the same time, I didn't really do that without meeting people in person first and kind of quizzing everybody that I could 
get it into conversation with and just say, you know, how does this work? Does this work for you? Are these people legit? Like, is this going to be okay? Like, there was a lot of questions and you don't really know. So it's really important to kind of form those those conversations and those relationships in person, I think, um, and then carry that online. I wouldn't try and just start fully online. Um, I think that that would be really, really difficult if you didn't already have a little bit of a community in place to tell you kind of wh what direction to go in. That's great. April, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself, your, you know, your, your journey as an artist um, and what your, you know, your inspiration in your work. Sure. Uh, my name is April Pine and um, I do geometric abstract paintings really inspired by my time living in cities. Um, they tend to be fragmented because I see the world is very fragmented. Um, but through my work, I try to bring um, a sense of peace and wholeness back to the world. Um, I love color, as you can see from my work. And um, uh, like Lynn's, I came to art about, or to say I started doing work professionally about six years ago. And um, I did it completely online because I'm so introverted and I'm so reserved. So for me, Google was my friend. <laughs> and that's how um, I've done most of my art journey that's been online. And so I'll be happy to share some of those things with everyone today. Amazing. And Tammy, why don't you tell us a little bit more? I know you introduced yourself. Love to have a quick kind of what brought you to Partial, why you got this started just quickly, and then we will dive into our, our, our panel. Okay, yeah. I guess um, I also am someone who's not professionally trained in the visual arts or in that space. I, I come from a graphic design, communications, marketing background. And um, I guess like how partial kind of manifested, I've always been a bit of an entrepreneur, but I think maybe around like around 2014, 2015, I started to like have this idea percolate in my head, which just kind of came out of this need of seeing um, friends of mine who were starting to uh, invest in their homes and all that sort of stuff, not really have an idea of where to get art. They were coming to me as their kind of, friendly, somewhat art savvy friend um, to ask, hey, Tammy, you know, I, I want to get some art. I don't necessarily want to go to a big box store, but I know nothing about galleries. Do you have any suggestions? So I was like, oh, this is interesting. There are these folks who um, are kind of without maybe even calling themselves that, like turning into art collectors, but they just didn't have um, a gateway into that space. And then on the opposite side, I had artist friends who were, you know, creating all this work in their studios and it was just piling up and they were practically like giving it away. They were trading, sharing it with friends and family, which is wonderful. But I guess like seeing as someone who comes from like a freelance design background, I kind of saw this like gap of people who want um, art and people who have art and then also how do you empower um, creatives and artists to be able to to generate some kind of living from this wonderful work they're creating so that idea kind of percolated I started doing research and then in 2016 um, launched partial as just like a trial Squarespace site and uh, from there was really lucky to bring on my tech co-founder Chris and we gradually built partial into what it is now um, learned a lot of lessons on the way it definitely wasn't as simple as I thought it was going to be um, I think art commerce in Canada is is not an easy thing to do there's a lot of learning there it's still a very like green industry I think which is really exciting because there's a lot of of room to experiment and over the last couple of years I think with the, I would say like, yeah, in the last couple of years have really seen like a boom in the online art world in Canada, like wonderful platforms like Imprimo popping up and yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's nice to be part of, I guess, this space that is just really coming into its own now. So that's partial. That's how we started. Thanks for sharing. To be honest, the first time I heard that story, I knew that our missions were really aligned, you know, both coming from the angle of 
you know, we come from a rice management of artists and you come from the side of, you know, really wanting to help, you know, artists and collectors come together and so on. Um, and, and I think, you know, we really share our, your vision and, and your mission here. Um, so when we looked at what it was building in Primo, building partial, or in the case of many artists here trying to build their own online presence, um, you know, I think that's a challenge that many, many people are facing. Um, it's not obvious, you know, typically artists tends to be um, good at their craft, not necessarily good at, you know, building websites and things like that. Uh, however, every artist is an entrepreneur, whether they like it or not, uh, is the nature of the beast, which comes with the importance of really expanding your network on a continuous basis. Many people hop for the road of galleries, but, you know, the road of uh, presenting yourself online is, is definitely an avenue that can be interesting to, to many people. So when we looked at building the presence, uh, building the presence online, you know, I'd be curious to see April's and Lynn's like, how what how did you go about it? What were the platforms um, that you were using, and and how did you see how did you see that change o over the years? So why don't we start with you, April, and then uh, we'll we'll go to Lynn's. Sure. Well, I started on Instagram, um, which I'm still on, and Facebook, which I'm still on, but I was also on Twitter, <laughs> which was um, maybe it works for some people, but I found it to be really inappropriate for art. <laughs> you know, which is so visual. Um, and so for me, my online presence was really scattershot. Like I thought you were just supposed to get your art in as many places as possible. And so not only was I on like a lot of social media platforms, I was even on Pinterest, I was on everything. Um, I also was on many different, um, I guess, art platforms. I was probably on four or five at one time and um, I got some really good advice and someone said, you really need to focus. Quality matters more than quantity. Um, and I'm grateful that that's around the time I met, um, I came into contact with Partial um, and that was really eye-opening for me. And so for now, um, I have very few platforms that I'm on because I've, I've found that to be best to um, cultivate the relationships on those platforms as opposed to being on many, many different things. And what about you, Linz? What has been your experience? How did you approach this? Did you, you start with a website? You start with social channels, different platforms? Take us to your experience. Um, so I, um, you know, I'm, I'm good to like go talk to people in person, but online, I have been an intensely private person my entire life. I am one of like, when the aliens land, I will be one of the very few people that never had a Facebook. I never had one. I have never been on there. I refused. Um, so I did an Instagram, but it was anonymous. It was the first one was like, they, nobody knew it was me. And I was posting anonymous me for a little bit. And then um, I got a studio with a kin collective and other artists started telling me like, you know, like that's not really a thing. Like you're not just gonna get yeah, discovered or something. And like, people are gonna be like, it's just weird. It's just weird. So stop doing that. Um, so yeah, pretty much as soon as I actually like put my name out there, put my face out there, said, this is what I'm doing. Um, things started happening and I, I got on partial and partial did a nice little feature on me, which was awesome. And like, it was good to kind of build things that way more organically, like as, as I was doing the work and people were noticing the work, then I was able to gather followers that way instead of like having to really promote myself. Cause it's just, I, I, I agree with you, April, there's like too many venues and a lot of them are just kind of black holes. You're just like, throwing your time and energy into them and you don't get anything back from them. So I think people really have to do what they're comfortable with and like what feels good to you. Like I wouldn't have been able to start with everything public from the very beginning. I needed my time as an anonymous <laughs> artist in order to kind of get started, but yeah, take your time, do what works for you. Yeah. Oh, and so yeah, and what is it definitely public way too soon. <laughs> I think for many people, there's a lot of people who are still hesitating to get started. Um, but the question is, you know, just start somewhere, do something, mm -hmm. right? But like you, like you said, Lindsay, you know, start with your own comfort and and, uh, and make it from there. So, so what what are some of the challenges that you guys face when you when you first start building your online presence, or you know, whether that was on partial on Instagram, other platforms? Like, what are some of the challenges that you that you start facing? I'll go first on that one. Um, I just found it really challenging to kind of like 
parse all the messaging. You get so much messaging like this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is how you're supposed to be doing it. Post this much, post at this time, post this, post that. Like it's just like it's overwhelming. And again, as a person who didn't necessarily have a lot of free time to devote to this sort of like other area of my life, it was really difficult to figure that out. And then in, on top of that, once I did start posting with my name and I was getting some attention and there was some press happening and whatnot, there was actually like trolls that came out on that. And I was not expecting that at all, but there were people like, you know, like, who do you think you are? Basically, like you just got here and you're getting this attention and like, why? And I'm just like, mm. I don't really care why I'm getting the attention. If you want to get some, go get some. Like, I can't really explain that to you, but yeah. So it was really just a very strange experience of um, not really knowing which way to turn and then kind of getting like this backlash of like, oh, huh? like why? That's interesting. I think a lot of people are facing that. And that's not something that is talked so much. And, you know, it can kind of feels, you know, when, when it first happens to you, you're just like, oh, what's happening? Is this normal? You know, am I doing something wrong? Uh, yeah. So I think it's great. It's great that, that you bring it up to, you know, if other people are experiencing that, um, it is quite normal. Uh, yeah, you know, I think and, it really, and, it hits a nerve because, you know, a lot of times you get stuff from friends and family, like, is this what you really want to do? Like, this is what you're going to do right now. And I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. So it, for me, it kind of toughened me up. But at first I was just like, where is this coming from? Like, this is so weird. And I'm like, this is why I was never online before. See? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, like about, what about, what about. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was just going to do a quick side note before we hear from April, but I was just going to say, I think that's like, kind of the one of the good like that's the good and bad thing with online is suddenly you're exposed to so many different people and so that's that's really unfortunate to hear that one would get negative feedback because I think like creating art is already quite a vulnerable um path to choose so it's it's kind of unnecessary to to get that kind of feedback on and I think that's sort of the thing with social media that's you know like Instagram is a great uh, I was about to say it's a great platform. I'm trying to decide if I still feel that way considering my own like Instagram addictions, but you know, it's, it's a thing that has an effect on people. We can affect, we can say that much. Um, so yeah, it is hard to balance the different things. Yeah. But I'd be interested to hear like April's take. Cause you know, like, you know, Lindsay, you were mentioning you are someone who's very comfortable with, with putting yourself out there and April, you're, you're a bit more, uh, controlled or private in that regard? Yes, it's true. Um, I think one of the mistakes I made in the beginning, um, and, and it's funny because I, I've had a lifelong love of art and I would, I would carry them around my little watercolor paints with me everywhere I went for years, you know, but I just thought you couldn't make a living at it. And then one day, you know, just um, exploring the internet, it, it was like a world opened up. It was like, wow, you, you could make a living at this. And so when I pursued it wholeheartedly, I actually think I put my art out too soon. <laughs> like, I, I don't think that I was quite, um, I don't think my art was quite in the place where it should have probably been exposed to the world just yet. I, I think it probably needed some more time to percolate. I probably need more time to develop my own voice before I put it out into the world. But if you look on my Instagram, that art is still there for anyone to see. Um, because the funny thing about it is I feel like it was a mistake that at the same time there are people that started following me back then that still follow me today. And they've been, um, they've been great all of these years. They've applauded me when I've done well. They've, um, I've gotten really good feedback from people over the years. And not a lot of negative. I'm so grateful. Um, and for me, I, I, I understand what Lynn's is saying as well, because it's very difficult to put yourself out there online. Um, I got advice from my, uh, from my brother, who's much more savvy about these things. He's like, you need to put your face on your Instagram. I said, why do they need to see my face? I'm selling art. I'm not selling my face. But um, he said, people need to have a personal connection and a face helps. Um, and so that that has also been a challenge for me as a very private person to um, to share those parts. But I'm working on it and I'm getting better all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, JD and I've had had conversations about this, too, like the 
you know, as someone, you know, I mentioned this before, I'm not, I wasn't when I started partial, I wasn't by any means an art expert, but something that I learned very quickly was that um, I think people who are buying into art that's at a certain price point. And that price point could be just be, we'll say over a hundred dollars for some people, you know, if, if it's mm -hmm. someone who's trying to cross that threshold of going from a uh, big box art to an original art piece, a lot of it so is about buying into the artist and the artist story. And I know that, you know, the profiles on Imprimo feature the artist heavily on partial is the same thing because, um, yeah, I feel like the aesthetics of the art piece, like capture someone's attention is what captures someone's attention. And then for them to really buy into it is they, at least in my opinion, and I'm also this type of art buyer is like, I then buy into the artist and mm -hmm. yeah, cause it's definitely a choice for someone to choose to, to invest in someone. And if they don't know that person or don't know too much about them, and it doesn't have to be like their entire story, but you know, I've seen artists on partial offer like a very professional distilled version of their bio and then others who just go like right into it like I love this food and I love this and I love that <laughs> like yeah and both work it's sort of whatever um the artist is comfortable with yeah yeah so an interesting point to add to that that uh, we heard from from our buyers is one of their favorite part of owning art it's just tell the story of it to your friends. Like, you know, if someone sees that art piece, oh, no, I really like this. Oh, let me tell you more about this artist and journey and so on. And, uh, and which is a very exciting part, but it's not always easy to find. Right. So I think it's important that as you put your presence out there, that you also keep that in mind, trying to make it accessible uh, very easily. So, so giving some of this, I know, you know, Tame, maybe Tammy, we start with you giving you know, the you know, their profile on partial, but what are some of the advice that you guys would give to someone who's trying to improve their online presence? Hmm, yeah, I mean, I would say that, yeah, definitely including insights into yourself helps, you know, whether it's on a platform like partial or in Primo or on your social media account, it's true. People love seeing someone's face. Um, I think people also love seeing behind the scenes stuff like, and there are different ways of going about it. Like obviously now there's like time-lapse videos and TikTok world, which is like kind of beyond me, but all of this is sort of getting people just like want to see how things are done. And I also feel like, um, you know, now this is me putting on my like marketplace hat, but I think sometimes for people to understand the value of art if they don't know what it took to make that piece, they 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 don't understand why it costs X, Y, Z. So sometimes those behind the scenes glimpses are great. Um, I think April, you kind of touched on this, which was nice is to, I think like streamlining things and like maybe thinking about your flow of, you know, like definitely having a social media presence is great. Think about like, okay, once I have, someone check out my Instagram, maybe I want to make sure that in my bio, I have links to the places where to my like personal website to where you can buy my art to my upcoming shows, like kind of think about your uh, journey of how to take someone who's just passively looking at something into someone who's like engaging with you. Um, yeah, but maybe I'll stop there because I'm sure April and That's some great advice, though, because I would say one of the things that we've noticed on many people, on many people, even the one that have amazing, you know, work and things like that, you look on their social platform, it's like, well, how do I see more? How do I see something different? And it's not always easy. So I thought that was a that was actually some great some great feedback. What are your thoughts, April? And you know, what what advice would you give someone who's trying to improve their online presence? I would say. Um present your art well, take good pictures of your art um, because you're, you're, this is where people are seeing your art. And I know this should be a non, like a no brainer, but um, it's something that I've needed to continually work on like my photographic skills because I didn't grow up taking pictures of everything. Um, and so learning how to take pictures of paintings really well or your art really well um, and showing it in ways that make it look its best in different environments. Um, 
I would say being consistent um, with wherever you're at, being consistent, producing the art. Um, I would say engaging with people online as well, you know, engaging with people when they ask questions or if they give you a thumbs up or whatever the case might be, because um, today's fan is tomorrow's collector. Um, and I would say also to um, create a real plan for yourself. Um, like my 11 year old nephew says, a goal without a plan is just a dream. So <laughs> that would be my advice. Yeah. yeah, that's great. What about you, Linz? That was awesome. Everything that April just said, absolutely. Please stop taking pictures of your art at like midnight inside a closet with a flash. It's just not good. Don't do that. Nobody wants to see that. Um, I think there's a lot of that out there. And yeah, that presentation really does matter, not just online, but also if you're gonna be applying to other shows, sending work to galleries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I would just take that a step further and say, you know, think about what you wanna do. Um, you know, we, we throw around this word in the art world a lot, the exposure word, the E word. If you just want exposure, okay, there's lots of ways to get exposure. There's tons and tons of people that will say that they're giving you exposure, but is that a career and is that what you really want? Um, so personally for me, I want to do more fine art. I want to be working with galleries. I want to be on a higher end. So it doesn't make sense for me to be on an exposure website with, you know, the girls in bikinis, like standing next to a painting. I don't know why they do that. It really bugs me. Um, I also uh, question, yeah, like Tammy said, like the, the um, time lapses and stuff are really cool. They can be extremely, extremely engaging. I think that that's a really good thing to do as long as you're doing all the other stuff online. But if you're only doing the time lapses, if you're essentially like creating asthma videos of you making art and then wondering why you're not making sales, like your followers are not gonna necessarily be art collectors that are looking to buy that art. The making of it and the sounds of it could be very, very engaging. But again, are those followers going to be the people that are actually leading to sales for you? And so just keep your eye on the ball in terms of what you really wanna be doing. Yeah, yeah. and it yeah. sounds like yeah, universally everybody's like, you need a plan and work to plan is kind of, and then reflecting on, is that, is that working for you? Uh, seems to be a key element here. Yeah. Well, you have to do that because everybody's got their hand out. Like, you know, everybody is taking money from artists and artists don't have any money to begin with. Like we're starting from nothing. And then, you know, every gallery is like, pay this hanging fee. Every show is like, pay this uh -huh. fee for this. And like everything costs money. So just be really targeted about what you actually want to do and what you actually want to put those marketing dollars towards. And I think also like dollars and time, you know, I feel this with partial too. like partial is a small business. We, if we could do all these things, like I'm not, I'm not, uh, that social media savvy, like for some young people, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing. My, I've got this like cold that everyone seemed to get over the holidays working through it. But I was going to say like, um, I guess thinking about what, how long things take you, and whether you can afford that time because you know for artists you're not only expected to like create great work but you're also then trying to manage a social media account and like update your website and keep your platforms up to date and like you know stay on top of shows or grants or what have you that's that could easily be a job for you know five people um you know it's sort of like maybe keeping an eye on what is actually not just generating likes but what's actually generating a meaningful engagement. It's okay if you have 90 followers on Instagram. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're less successful because you might be putting that time rather into social media. You've realized that, you know, showing up at your neighborhood art fairs and doing those every summer are how you make it work. And that's okay, you know? So um, yeah, I think it's like kind of like experimenting and realizing you can't do all the things, but just choose the things that work for you. Makes sense. Yeah. And Tammy, you, you told us a little bit more about why you created Partial. Um, and I'd love to hear more about 
What did you see in the marketplace? I know that Partial has a fairly focused approach towards um, their arts on the marketplace. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit more about the needs that you saw and, mm-hmm. and, and how you, you're going about uh, filling it? Yeah, so I think like something that I learned very quickly was that, um, first of all, the Canadian art market is like a teensy tiny drop compared to the rest of the world, you know, like Europe and the US and Asia is very, is is a much more stronger and robust um, art buying market. Again, I look on like the glass half full side of things where because it's still a growing industry in Canada, there's a great opportunity to shape it into something that is like, I guess, like representative of what we want to say Canadian art means. Um, So I think like learning through all that, I realized uh, that perhaps the affordable art category, and I'll use affordable art as work that's under $5,000 is definitely maybe the place to start for, for partial. Um, because I mean, when we started it, I always, I wanted regular people to realize that they could be art buyers and art collectors too. And I also know that for artists, um, yeah, there's the opportunity for like a more meaningful connection between uh, someone in their locale who's like recognize their work. I think that's really exciting when someone who, who is say like in Toronto and then sees, you know, work by April in New Brunswick or sees work by Linz um, in Toronto as well to be like, hey, I can actually afford this. I can put some money aside or I can use our like rental program or something to bring that work into our house. Like, I think that was the first step was just wanting people to try bringing original art into their house and making that accessible. So, so that meant giving them lots of options online. That was like one thing, like, yeah, to a one-stop shop, like the, not, not everyone's comfortable with walking into a brick and mortar gallery. Um, I think brick and mortars are amazing. They serve like a very wonderful purpose in terms of like, uh, an experience for folks and for a certain type of art buyer, it's where they go. But I think for the vast majority of folks in Canada, um, an online space where they could see thousands of options, see work that's anywhere from say $50 to over $5,000, use the tools that are available with technology, like augmented reality and stuff to place things in their home, um, read about the artist and actually be able to connect directly with the artist. These are all things that I kind of learned the hard way as we built partial <laughs> to what, what would work and what wouldn't work um, when it came, came to art buying. Um, yeah, we just like, I just ended up, you know, working with Chris, my co-founder and a team of really wonderful collaborators to sort of build things to replicate that really meaningful, like human aspect of art buying that I think is important and try and imprint that onto like a tech experience so people can like do that from their couch and you know within a week have an art piece hanging on their wall um I think in the pandemic a lot of it probably came very very uh handy uh to be able especially yeah I mean that was interesting like during the pandemic I think we had something wild like the number of art rentals and art sales like increased by like five to 10 times just within that period. Cause I think that was a really like a horrible time but also a special time for folks to like spend time at home, reflect on where they're putting their money. There was like more of a movement towards supporting local and makers and artists which I think was long overdue. So that was, yeah, that was good, but yeah. Great. And so April, Lindsay, both are selling your work on on, uh, on Partial. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what attracted you to Partial? How did you, why did you go on, why, why did you go on Partial? I know we heard from Lindsay how you met, uh, how you met Tammy, but why don't you go uh, and tell us a little bit more about uh, how you went about this? We'll start with you, April. Um, I was attracted to Parcel because it was Canadian. Um, I'd worked with um, larger art, art, you know, online, let's say retailers um, from the U.S. And I found like I was just getting lost in the shuffle. Um, and I thought, you know, I think 
I think my art is original and interesting and I just don't think there are enough eyes on it. Um, and so I liked that partial was Canadian. I liked that they were very like hands-on with my artwork. Like they, they've been so good about marketing my art and pushing my art forward and talking about me as an artist actually taught me a lot about marketing, just looking at the way that they do their newsletters and, you know, the way that they do their Instagram. Um, and so these were things that attracted me to partial. Um, I also liked that they had, um, that they had a system for, you know, that they didn't accept every single artist, like that they, I was juried in, you know, so um, that they had a, a certain standard for their art. Well, and I appreciated that. And I felt so good, you know, when I, when I got in, I told my husband, I was like, they chose me. I was so excited, you know, and, um, and yeah, it's been a really good experience working with partial. Amazing. And what about you, Lindsay? You met Tammy alive. Yeah, same. I mean, April, we are so in sync here. Partial was so <laughs> aspirational for me. Like I, I hadn't even put a painting out there, you know, and I had met Tammy um, they were doing a, they were, you guys were like hosting the thing in the beginning of the, um, the outdoor art fair. And I was just like, whoa, this is so cool. They have like an artist lounge here. They're doing these interviews. Oh my God, this is like amazing. Yeah, I was really into it. Um, so I thought it was just really, um, it felt so affirming to have my work on partial. And it did feel like they had a really strong handle on the quality control and it wasn't just kind of a free-for-all which unfortunately a lot of sites are um and yeah the canadianness is a big deal um to everything that tammy said earlier you know we just don't have the opportunity to ship things like they do in the states and that's a huge problem in canada in terms of the proliferation of online art there's really kind of a limit of what you can do and so with partial that i'm able to speak directly with the buyer that we're able to talk about, like, are you in the area? Can I drive it to you? You know, and that opens up a lot more possibilities in terms of the work that I'm able to sell. Um, so I personally, I work, I work big. I like big work. I'm a person like this one is huge. Um, I don't really want to have to dumb that down in order to sell into the States. And I don't sell any small work on partial. This is something that's really dear, near and dear to me. I, I sell big work on partial. I, I have $30 prints on partial. I have never sold any of the prints on partial. I have sold <laughs> big paintings that I've had to deliver and install because they're so big. Um, and that's awesome. Oh, and I wanted to tell a pandemic story. Can I tell a pandemic story? Go ahead, story? yeah, yeah, for sure. So in the middle of pandemic, like when there was really like full lockdown, like hardly anything was open, um, I got a rental request and the woman who did the rental, uh, she lived like a block from me. So she was like, can you deliver this? Like, I really, really want to make sure that we get some new art in the house. Like, it's so boring here. We need, you know, we need some light and color. And I was able to deliver the painting. Um, we never met in person, but it just felt so good to just, um, you know, put it on her doorstep and then get a message a half an hour later that she loves it. And here's what it looks like on the wall. And then when I walked by, I could see it in the window. And like, this just kept me going for like all pandemic. And we just kept chatting and trading messages. Like, do you see the coffee shop is open? Like, it was such a good connection to have, to kind of Aww. bring that. And, um, uh, rentals are awesome like for people to be able to try art because I think there's also a kind of this idea like what if it doesn't look like what it looks like yeah. online and you know mm -hmm. photography of art is really tricky and it can be really difficult and art does look different in different light conditions um, but I've never had a rental come back all of my rentals that have gone out on partial have been purchased and it's just really nice to know that people were able to try it before they buy it yeah uh, I think that's a very interesting concept the idea yeah of being I really able love to, to rent it Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh no! I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish, JD. Uh, with the <laughs> uh, I just, I, I just, I was just gonna say, I think it's really awesome the idea of being able to, to, to rent it. Like, uh, Linz, I think you, like, well, you're right. You look at something online, you get and see it, you put it in your space, and you're like, ah, is this gonna really work? And and many people have that question, and because of that, they probably don't move forward. But now yeah. you're able to try. It's like it doesn't work. I can just bring it back. But yeah. when the reality is once you have it on your wall, 
you're probably no it does work so <laughs> now i want to keep it i don't want to go i don't want to go and find another piece so i thought it's a really interesting way to kind of tease the people who maybe today are out there buying prints on etsy or something like that mm -hmm. to have an opportunity to kind of de-risk their approach to buying original art maybe for the first time or something like that mm -hmm. so that's certainly one of the one of the part of partial that i think is quite attractive that you, you don't see you don't see uh, being done successfully many places Right. Yeah, and then it, go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, okay, sure. I'll, I'll just quickly. I mean, I was going to say, like, that was, I realized I hadn't spoken too much about the rentals, but, like, yeah, that was part of, I guess, like, the mandate of partial was, like, trying to get more art on more walls. So what does that mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's like, creating more accessible bridges to art. So, like, the, the rentals, the way that those work are for um, artists who have a pro subscription, they can have their artwork um, insurance protected and rented for certain periods of time, depending on who the, the renter is. Um, and then at the end of that period, the renter can just pay the difference to own it. And this was sort of twofold. I, as I was doing my research, I realized that some artists were like loaning their artwork out. And then mm -hmm. of course me being like a uh, freelancer advocate being like, Oh, your time is your value. I was like, loaning <laughs> you mean not generating revenue for this piece that you have created that this person should probably pay you for um that's why we built this like rental model to a like give create like a model where artists could generate some revenue with this artwork you know the goal of course is that the renter would pay the difference at the end to own it but also even if they do return it after that period of time in my mind, it's still a win for the artists who have generated that income and that person would have enjoyed that piece for X number of months, people would have seen it, so on and so forth. Um, but then, uh, yes, but also, uh, again, going back to things I was learning about the Canadian art buying market, like the more, the more bridges we could build to make it easy to try, uh, you know, low risk, the better and I think like the the excitement of you know the stories that you're sharing lens about people connecting was really is is a huge reason for why we made partial the way it is like I love those human connection stories um and yeah it's exciting when people who thought they would never be an art buyer become a first-time art buyer and maybe become a lifetime art collector and I think that's an amazing an amazing gift so yeah, I agree yeah. With that. Yeah, I have a little more story. Can I go, go ahead. More? <laughs> <laughs> um, so before the summer sale, uh, Tammy, when I knew the summer sale was going to happen and um, it hadn't been announced yet to the public, I had a rental. And when I went to drop off the rental, like I, I just always thank people in general, like not just thank you for like buying my art, like thank you for even looking at art. Thank you for even considering art. Thank you for making a place in your budget for art. Like this is a really important, special thing. And I told them at that time, um, it was a rental that I was dropping off. And I said, you know, here's my work. I hope you love it. I hope it's perfect for you. But once again, I want it to be perfect for you. If it's not, by all means, you know, bring it back to me and I'm happy for you guys to buy something else. And there's going to be a sale. So if you needed like a stretch goal of like, here's something that we can't quite afford, but you might be able to afford it now. So I'm just telling you, you don't have to buy my art, buy somebody else's art, but buy art. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. And just one more. I know, sorry, JJ, I know there's <laughs> another question you want to get to, but I was going to say that that sort of post sale thing to, to then go back to, you know, like things that artists can do. Um, to, I think, like, turn that, you, you never know if that, like, one-time art buyer might just become, like, a lifetime art patron for you, um, but April, I'd actually purchase a small piece from April. April, you're obviously not in Toronto, where I am, but there are ways to create that connection, even if you don't see each other face-to-face, -face. like, April, you packed it beautifully, you included this lovely card, um, yeah, things like that, I think, really seal the deal for somebody um, from the art buyer side. Uh, yeah, so that was just one more note for people to take. I think that's a good point, you know, really kind of, you know, you go online and you build, you know, you have the sale, 
but um you know if you're not able to meet with them face to face and have that relationship like when said like that just a special note to like that like it does go a long way right and it really makes a difference on whether this person is going to continue to interact with you as an artist right and try to, to to seek you know to see what else you're 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 building what else you're you're creating and so on but uh, April, tell us more about your experience using Partial, you know, um, some personal experience that you've had, you know, um, things that you've liked and how you maybe how you how you found the the checkout process uh, with the with the buyers, because I know a lot of people had questions around how does that work and what has been the experience from people on Partial. Well, I'll I'll go back just for a moment to what Tammy said about the way it was packaged and um because I'm a self-taught artist, I'm always trying to learn. And Partial actually had like a, a mini seminar on packaging for their artists. Like how do you package your artwork correctly? How do you get it there so that it'll be safe? And I took my notes and, um, and I decided because I sell um, larger paintings, but I also sell, sell very small paintings because my thought was that I wanted all kinds of different people to be able to buy my work. You know, I thought about people I grew up with and family members. And I know how special it is to hold a piece of artwork in your hand, even if it's very small, it's still original to the artist. And so um, the thought is you can make that very special for, for a person. But to talk about more about my experiences with Partial, I have loved using the checkout. Um, aspect of partial because you can interact with the buyer, um, with the customer, they can, they can ask you questions. I've gotten beautiful, wonderful comments um, from people during that time telling me how they love the work and um, really encouraging me with, with my art and with what I'm doing. And partial makes the checkout um, aspect really easy. So um, the first time I went through it, I thought, oh man, the shipping, like, do I have to do something special for the shipping? But Partial had included all of that um, in the checkout process. So it was really seamless for me as an artist. Um, and I would also say that um, Partial has been um, really wonderful with um, presenting my artwork. You know, the sale, they, they put it on the front, on the first page, you know, of, um, of Partial's website. Um, so I've had a really good experience with Partial. I've been with them for, for two years um, and I don't see anything changing anytime soon. Great. So Tammy, what advice would you give people who've never sold work online? Because I know we've have uh, many people on the call today who, who have never sold online uh, or a lot of questions about this. We keep getting into our inbox uh, leading up to this event. So what are the advice you would give to someone who's maybe approaching this for the first time? Maybe it doesn't even have a strong or, or online presence, still shy about it. I'm not sure about the process. What advice would you give those people? Um, I think, well, definitely get started. If it's like, you know, don't be afraid to get started i think it can be it can feel overwhelming to, to set up profiles and put your work out there but um i think the hardest part is just getting started um i think also having a few different avenues like maybe maybe i mean the thing that i've always used to say is like you know with partial we wanted to sort of disrupt the industry a little bit in the sense where we weren't out there to be like a gallery with the strict gallery models and the strict gallery commissions um, that were relatively high, I would say, when I first entered the space compared to what I thought was um, reasonable for an online platform. But like have, do your kind of in-person things. I think the like spreading your web to, to reach as many people as possible. So with Partial, we do our work to, to try and not just attract artists, but also like art lovers, art likers, art, art buyers, um, and have them all kind of gather in one place. Um, and a lot of that could be driven from traffic via individual artists' Instagram. Like sometimes we have folks, I mean, we actually, we also have like partnerships with some organizations. So a really great partnership we had with with OCAD, I'll use this as an example, that actually drove OCAD's audience to Partial, which was amazing because suddenly all these folks who uh, were interested in buying OCAD art 
were also in, then introduced to art by artists who maybe weren't affiliated with OCAD. And that was that was really exciting. So I think the same kind of theory could work for artists is, um, yeah, uh, think of your handful of streams to funnel uh, into one place. Um, I mean, hopefully that's partial if, if you like um, the platform. Um, but yeah, find a way to make it easy for people to buy your art. And some people can manage it on their own. Like we've tried to cover everyone's bases in terms of making the checkout and all that stuff easier so that artists don't have to manage it themselves. Um, but yeah, we also captured a lot of stuff in the conversation that I think was helpful in terms of like how you photograph your work, how you present yourself. Um, but yeah, I think just getting started and, and feeling it out and you can always tweak your profiles like you can on Imprimo as you like, as you learn. Um, yeah. Great. And now on to the hard question. How do you guys go about pricing your work? Because I know that for many artists, this is the continuously hard question on how do you go about this? How do you know you got the right price point? Many just default to the galleries doing that for them. But for you guys who are selling online, how are you going about pricing your work? Do you want to do you want to take a to take a to start uh, April and then we'll go with Lens? Sure. Um, because because I'm a self-taught artist, I looked at other artists who were um, in the same place that I was. So I looked at their experience level. I looked at, you know, where they'd shown their work and how they were selling their work. And so I looked at people that were around my price point and I looked at what they were selling their art for. There are different formulas, of course, for selling your art, you know, um, the square footage. I mean, if you if you did, if you sold art by the amount of time that went into it, I, I don't think art would ever sell um, because I spend just as much time on small pieces as I do on a large piece. Uh, so I, I know that pricing can be very difficult, but that was what I did. I looked at other artists and I did research in that way. And honestly, I, I have gone wrong with this as well. So it does take some tweaking. Yeah. And what about you, Linz? Any, any, uh, how do you go about this? Any, any tips or tricks? Mm, so for several years, I priced, you know, I, again, I did the comparables and whatever, and then it was purely emotion, just straight emotional pricing, which was a, a mistake and probably something that I shouldn't have done. Um, and then when I started working with galleries, my prices weren't high enough and they'd be like, no, we don't want to take your work because your price isn't high enough and it doesn't make enough money for us. And, you know, it's not worth it. Um, and then I got some really good advice uh, from a curator um, who said, you know what, like, I know that you want regular people to be able to buy your stuff. You're way better off to do the gallery pricing and be like, hey, let me do you a solid and like make this affordable for you as opposed to having a different price for regular people and a different price for galleries. Um, so at this point, I'm into a very simple homemade pricing matrix that is a square inch plus complexity plus time plus materials it's really easy it just spits itself out cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> many, many different uh, aspects to make it easy at the end for you <laughs> Um, Tammy, I know that Partial has some guidelines to, to help make that a little bit easier um, for artists who might be doing that from the first time. A any, any tips or, uh, around how to go about pricing for someone who may have never sold work uh, online before? Yeah. Um, I mean, Mina later on is going to actually be able to show one of the like tools we have on Partial that addresses this very complex question. Um, but yeah, I would say like what April and Linz brought up, those are all great. I think um, definitely thinking about the time that it takes you to make a painting and maybe, and you know, maybe this is a good exercise for anyone who hasn't done it before is like actually log hours for an art piece and just get a sense of actually how many hours did this take me? Cause you know, it probably took a lot longer than you thought. I think sometimes people are like, oh, it's just my time. And oh, I just had a couple hours here and a couple hours there. But once you start logging it, it's like, wow, this like small painting actually took me, you know, 20 hours. 
And then maybe one way of the going about it is like, okay, let's say 20 times whatever a reasonable hourly rate is plus materials, let's say plus packaging if you're shipping. Um, that should give you at least a baseline of at least what it could cost. Like that's that's maybe one way of going about it. Of course, there's so many other things that go into that factor, like your your CV, your years of experience, uh, your reputation, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think in terms of just pricing fairly and honoring uh, your time and your talent, yeah, establishing, it's better to go a little bit over than under. And I know this, even as someone who, you know, was a freelance designer, it took years to learn to not undervalue myself. And you'd also be surprised what people would be willing to pay. Like, I think, mm -hmm. I think uh, folks have a habit of uh, like bargaining internally on behalf of the uh, art buyer when really they would have been like, Oh yeah, great. Sure. I'll put it on my card or whatever. So I think, yeah, uh, honor yourself, think about what it's worth. And then if they are like genuinely like, oh my gosh, I love this piece so much, but it's just a little bit over what I can afford at this stage. You can, you know, come up with a plan, maybe offer that they rent it for a few months and then they pay the difference. You can give a bit of a discount if you need to, but it's, um, yeah, it's a tricky one. It takes practice, but yeah, maybe like think of what your work is worth and then like add like 20% or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. With that, we'll wrap the artist panel. We still have a, a few, so we'll go over a little bit of Imprimo. I know there's some questions in chat on what's the difference between Imprimo and Partial. Uh, so I want to take uh, Tank Tammy, Tank Lens, and April for joining us today. Uh, with that, I will take it away and start with the conversation with Imprimo, and then Pat will finish with uh, Partial. We'll take us through how exactly the platform works uh, and more the nitty gritty of the functions. So before I dive into this, kind of big difference between partial and Imprimo. Um, what is Imprimo? Imprimo is said to be the LinkedIn for visual artists, where artists come, you know, pre present themselves professionally and interact with different uh, members of the art ecosystem. Today, Imprimo has main only artists. What is to come over the next year? You'll see galleries, marketplace like partial. We'll see art organization join, as well as art buyers and art collectors uh, more towards the end of the year, which will interact kind of similar to how you see recruiters, employees, and employers uh in track on on, um, on uh, LinkedIn so a lot is to come to change we're very excited about a lot of different things that are coming out uh, on uh, Imprimo. We'll have our premium model that is coming out in the next uh, four or five weeks, and we'll, which will allow you to have custom URL, allow you to uh, to manage your, your collection um, uh, more effectively, as well as uh, some other great benefits. But with that, I will give you a quick overview of Imprimo and at the same time kind of touch on some of the things that we've learned while doing the interviews on Imprimo, um, the, inter the interviews with our uh, when we're building in Primo on what's important when building your your online presence. So this this is our Imprimo platform. Uh, when you land on Imprimo, we created this, this the homepage to be where you could you would go and consume art. So this is an infinite scroll, uh, and this is where you'll see the art appear. You have the ability to use the different filters and categories uh, and mediums that appear. And as you can see, I have selected. Uh, installations. So one of the things that was important for us is to make it very aesthetically pleasing to look at the, uh, the art while making it very easy to discover who is the artist and what is the work. So when you hover over the image, you see the avatar of the artist, you see the name of the artist, the name of the piece um, that appears right here. And then as soon as you move, uh, it removes. So that was one thing that was very important um, to us to make it very easy to discover um, who does this work belong to. Now, if we look at an artist profile, so we've touched on a few of these elements already. Uh, you know, when you when you go on Imprimo, very first thing you notice is the avatar that is here, where you see the headshot. Some of the some of the things that we've learned is not only is it important, we've heard uh, Linz and, and April talk about the importance of having a headshot, but here's some stories to give you guys an idea of the value of it. We had some artists who own their website does not have their headshot. 
And when they started using in Primo, what they realized is while they had exhibition, they had a lot of people coming up to them and say, oh, this is you, right? Which versus before there was just a name on the artwork and the artist wasn't the, was the gallery there to exhibit, but was not having conversation because nobody knew exactly who they were. So just by having their headshot there, it immediately drove some opportunities for the artist by being able to be identified um, physically. So that's one of the big advantage. And I would say this applies to any of your social platforms, right? It is, it, it, we really highly encourage that you have some images uh, of yourself so that the, uh, the artist can, uh, the artist, the art lovers can identify you. Some artists choose to stay anonymous, but again, we, we've, we heard the same thing as you, as Lynn said, um, you know, it does drive opportunities if they're able to identify you. And then when you look here, you see uh, here we have Randa in our studio. Uh, and then another important part that we've heard is if we can see the, the personal relationship that the artist has with the, with their work, right? It drives significantly more interest in, in their work. We highly encourage when you build your Primo profile to take advantage of the cover image that's there to use something. It could be you at work in your studio. Um, it could simply be your favorite artwork, but again, it's been, it's been said times and times again that seeing images of the artist and the work um, significantly drive the interest. And then we have the biography. Some here I think is really important to try to highlight some of the details. Uh, for example, Randa is an artist from Syria, Syria who moved to Canada. She has a very unique story. Uh, it really drives interest in, in her work and brings some, some little bit of um, uh, more details about the origin, the origin of her work and the inspiration, which I think is quite important. So keeping that in mind as you as you build your biography, your origin and your inspiration is certainly a very important part. And then finally, we touched on that. I think when we talked about building your online presence, what we heard loud and clear is that having a plan is important and working your plan. And what we saw on many artists who are out there promoting themselves, you, they have they might have a beautiful online presence, yet it's very difficult for us to, to, to see their other social channel where, where they might be putting a lot of work on, on, on uh, Instagram, yet if I'm on their website, it's really hard for me to be transported over to, um, to their other social channel. So what we wanted to do on Imprimo was to make it very easy to have all of your link that are centralized. But again, that concept would apply to any of your social channel. You can do the same thing on most platforms, but quite important to have one, one centralized location where people can see all your different um, social platforms, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, your website, your partial website, your handle, and, and so on. So I highly encourage you to do that. And then obviously we build a function to have make an inquiry here where they can easily contact you. Uh, I would say the same thing. If it's hard for them to contact you on your social platforms, they'll probably shy away from doing it. Now, and when we built the CV, what we've heard is when you look at a typical CV, you get a black and white uh, CV that looks like this for, for galleries and granting bodies certainly does the job. But when it comes to art lovers, it may or may not signal the magnitude of some of these events. So we want to create something that was significantly more engaging for our lovers. And this is why you see these red plus. So when you click on the red plus, there's a couple things that happen. First of all, you see the artwork here. These are the artwork that were exhibited. They are link to the CV event, right? And then you're able to add videos, images, documents to help support the uh, the claims that are being made. In this case, we can see Randa at the exhibit, right? She has added some more text that tells us about this. And in this one, she has videos uh, and so on. So this does two things. First of all, it really helped explain the magnitude of some of these events. Uh, and the size of some of her piece, which otherwise you know you may not even know what piece were exhibited or 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 the size or the size of this event. So it drives a lot more interest. The second thing it does, it elevates significantly the trust on the claims that are being made. You know, you see a CV like this as an art lover, your first question is, is that true? That did that really happen? Right. And and there's been a lot of and a lot of things in the industry that's been done that, you know, this is not exactly how it happened. So we want to bring a lot more um all more trust to some of these events that are there while driving engagement. And that was the idea behind the CV. Now, when we did that, some of what we heard from many artists is the process to put my CV up to date is quite tedious and it takes precious time away from making art. So we did something to try to tackle that and we'll touch on this in a second. But let's first look at, um, at uh, an artwork record. So when building in Primo, we wanted to do a few things. We wanted to make uh, the make it easy for artists to either replace or enhance their website 
their digital presence. And we also wanted to make it very easy for work to be properly attributed to artists. We've heard so many stories of artists getting ripped off or decided to work on a t-shirt and a cup or something like that. And we really wanted to try to, to tackle some of these things. And what we realized is the easiest, the easiest thing to do was to make the information publicly available. When talking to a lot of the misuse that we saw, the, the case the case for misuse that we saw, um, in many cases, people who use the work to do these things were actually unaware that, you know, as, as much as I say, they didn't even understand that this image belonged to somebody when they used it. And there's a lot of education to be done uh, at that point. So what we wanted to do is at least if someone is want, wants to do good and wants to use the piece correctly, that they can come on in Primo, they can learn who, who this works belongs to. To, um, and then seeing what the work is available for. So, and that, so we'll go over some of these features there. Another thing that we wanted to do is make it easy for artists to register their creative claims, um, their, their claims to copyright uh, as part of um, Ivan Primo. So, looking at the artwork record, some of the first thing that you see here is that you can't right click on the image um, to, to save it. So this is some of the things that we've done to prevent piracy. Uh, the second thing is the image as an artist, you entered in high definition, but as a viewer, what I'm looking at has been reduced in resolution. So if I was to take a screenshot, I can't save it. If I'm trying to do a screenshot, I end up with an image that's in lower resolution and I'm probably not able to do anything meaningful with that image, right? However, as a user, when I look at it, it looks great. So that was really important to us. This is fully automated. You don't have to do anything as an artist. Uh, you know, it's reducing resolution. What you enter is in high dev and you can remove it. Uh, you can, uh, resolution, you can take it out whenever you want, but as what we see is in lower resolution. So that's what we've done to prevent some of the aspects to prevent piracy. What we've done to try to encourage the redirecting of, uh, of um, the redirection for artists, when you click the share button and you have a series of different platforms that you can share, I uh, use LinkedIn as an example. When I go to share a post on, of course, because I'm trying to show you guys the image is not gonna work. Let's try this one more time. All right. There. So when you go to share the image, typically you'd share your posts on LinkedIn, Facebook, or so on, and you'd share an image of your work and you'd have you know a caption that looks something like, oh, here's my new work, here's some more detail. If you have more and if you have more questions, click on the link below and you can access it on my website. Many, many call to action that very little people will actually take. Right. So what we wanted to do was to allow the artists to share their work while making it very easy to be redirected where they can actually purchase the work. So when you click on the image, you're actually redirected to the artwork record, which is a very involuntary action. Right. Many people who are just looking at the image might click on it accidentally. So we wanted to make it super easy for artists to share their image on all kinds of platform and being able to, you know, get, send their audience over to their profile very effectively. So these were built um, to, to help with the artists. Now, when I go back to the post here, then the other thing that you can see is that little thumbprint here uh, that appears. First of all, it acts a little bit as a watermark if someone would be to do a screenshot, uh, they would end up with that on their image. But what this is, is the blockchain ID. So we register the creative claim on the blockchain. Um, what is blockchain? Blockchain is a spreadsheet a ledger, a spreadsheet that is shared publicly, which can be access, access to from anybody. Um, and every entry is permanent, meaning that if I was to put an entry today, ABC, and I press enter, and I realize I made a mistake, I can't, I can't delete it. I have to go and enter a second entry. The value for that when it comes time to entering copyright claims or cre creative claim, I should say, uh, is that nobody can come after the fact and say, well, you changed the information after, right? Because it is one that once it's entered, it's timestamp and it's permanent, it has a lot of legitimacy to the process. So what we register, we register the name of the artist, the name of the work, the metadata about the work, the copyright holder, the year it was created, and the person who's made the claim. So this information is entered on one side on the blockchain, uh, which is really acting as a way to record your uh, claims to copyright. And then, and then on the other side, every artist on Imprimo has to verify their ID. 
we want to prevent bad actors to come on our platform. There's no bot, right? As you come in as an artist, you got to verify your ID. You take a picture uh, of yourself. You take a selfie. You take a picture of your driver's license. You compare the name on the account with the driver's license. We compare the two photos, and that's how you get your ID verified. Once your ID is verified, you're able to, pu to publish on Imprimo. Now, we know that in this case, Patty Lame, who is on Primo, has had his ID verified. Therefore, he is who he pretends to be. And on the other side, we have uh, a claim that has been registered on the blockchain. We link the two of them to a cryptographic signature, which means that not only did the person call Patty Lame make that claim on the blockchain, but Patty Lame, who's on Primo, whose ID has been verified, which really helped uh, enhancing the authentication process. So this process that I just explained to many is going to be very complicated. Uh, we understood that. So we automated 100%. As an artist, you come, you put the name, you, you just type your information on your artwork, and everything I just said happened automatically. Um, so you, know, you, you reap all the benefits from the, from the technology without needing to understand anything about the technology um, to be able to use it. So that was quite important to us. Another thing that's important to say is, you know, environment is extremely important to us and to many artists. And we use a special system using blockchain that use significantly less energy than, than what you would see uh, on, on the typical the typical ways of using blockchain and some of the posts you might have saw on social media. To give you guys an idea, um, we use it, but as much as it takes to boil a kettle over a period of a month is about the same energy that we're using uh, with blockchain. So that was really important. I know it's important for a lot of people, so it's worth mentioning. So now we touched on the blockchain registration. We touched on what we have did to protect the image and how we made it easy to reshare. Now, when we talk about the online presence, uh, I think what's important is to be able to list what the work is available now on so on Imprimo, you are we're not a marketplace you cannot buy on Imprimo. that's why we partnered with a company like partial who specialize in the sales Imprimo is meant to allow you to replace your your website or to enhance your website your digital presence but not to sell however we do want to coordinate these different uh, opportunities and we think that it's very important whether it is on Imprimo or somewhere else that you make it very easy to know what is the work available one of the advantage of imprimo is that on most marketplace you know they're very focused on the sales once your piece is sold they exit the platform and it becomes a lot more challenging to find the information the beauty of imprimo is the is it's your persistent presence where once even if the piece is sold the information can remain on imprimo and then you can point the, the buyers over once they bought the piece over to imprimo to learn more but we'll touch on that in a second but i think it's important that you list what the work's available for in many cases some people may not understand that it's available for other things like professional services and so on. Now, touching to the creation story, we touched on it when we talked about the importance of a uh, online presence and, and, and the engagement on your platform. People want to know how the work was created and the inspiration. That information is almost always eliminated from what we saw online. It is the part that people want to see. In this case, on Imprimo, you can use videos that describe the process. We can see images here to show the creation process. There's some different text uh, and so on. So that really helps explain the inspiration, the material. Like Tammy said, we have you know one of the artists, Nancy Cole, that we have on our platform. She used photography, embroidery. Like if you see the process of it, it brings so much more interest in what she's doing. It's so it's such a detailed work. Where if you look at the image itself without really seeing the process, I'm not sure that you'd be able to see the magnitude of what she's actually creating. So you know, I think it's a very important part. Uh, and I would say for all the artists who are in Primo, uh, if you haven't taken a look at the creation story, you should. If we keep we continuously hear feedback that. This is the part of the website that people likes the most. It brings to life the artwork. It's a lot more than just looking at the JPEG. It's really looking at, you know, the life that of the artwork up until the point where it came um, to its final product. So very important part. And then the, the other thing that we wanted to do was to make the provenance event easily to access because it's been in the industry. It's quite hard to access. The piece leaves the, leaves the artist and then after that, it's really hard to track it. So we wanted to try to, to uh, find a few solutions here as well as to be able to list the, the artwork, this life cycle of the artwork. So as you can see here, you can see the journey of the artwork. When you click on the red pluses, you can see different images that, and videos and so on that explains 
the different events that we have. And uh, here, one of the things that I want to point out is when we when you enter the details on the artwork record, what we've done, because we understand that you know there's quite a bit of administration that comes with uploading these images, uh, what we wanted to do is to make it very easy for, for the artist. Therefore, when you enter the artwork timeline, when you enter the event on the artwork timeline, it also populates your CV. And let me show you quickly what that looks like. So in this case, I had this exhibition at Gallery 501. If I go into Patty's CV, and here I am, and I see once again, Gallery 501, I have the same events that appear. Patty did not actually have to enter these details here. So as you go, when you enter the information on the artwork timeline, your CV is automatically populated. We eliminate about 60% of the process of updating um, your CV through that method. So that was one thing that was quite important to us. We're trying to reduce administration through, through a series of mechanisms, uh, and that was one of them. So a couple other things that I want to touch on before I pass it to Tammy. Uh, when we talk to artists, some of the things that they, we've heard is that when it comes time to selling the work, uh, especially the one that represents themselves, they take care of their, their own documentation, uh, which is not always professional and even less often consistent, right? So we wanted to make something that was super easy. So we created these certificate of creations that you simply have to click the button like I just did here. They appear. You'll see all the metadata and the information related Related to the work as well as the QR code. The big advantage for the QR code is that, like I said uh, earlier in the, in, the, in the call, the art lovers and the art buyers likes to share the story of the artist. Yet, you know, unless they saw you or they talked to you when you sold the piece, they may have not heard the story. They probably didn't write it down. Um, and now with the QR code, you can scan the QR code. You land on the artwork record. And you hear, and you can learn the full story of the work uh, directly by scanning this. So it does two things. First of all, it makes it easy when you sell in the primary market. But the great value is as the piece change from hand to hand in the secondary market, it allows the artist to remain in control of the narrative of their story and the story to follow as the piece exchange hand. You can also use that in different use cases as, you, as your piece change from gallery to gallery. Uh, you could also use that where they can scan the QR our code uh, and directly access the information on Imprimo, uh, reducing the amount of times that you have to send emails and information uh, to the galleries. So that's, that was some of the ideas behind that. And then finally, we created these QR code themselves, which allows you to have you have physical exhibition. You can affix it next to the artwork. It allows you to come and scan this. The, the, the art lovers can learn the full story, see the creation story, the life cycle through the artwork timeline, and gain a lot more depth about the story of the work. So the feedback we've got from artists is not only did we see a lot more people than they taught scanning the QR code, but it dramatically changed the conversation. Right? What we saw was some uh, some of the uh, art lovers came and had a lot more in-depth questions and drove significantly more opportunities for their work, right? So this is a way that you can use this tool, that this our online platform and Primo to also help you drive uh, more opportunity in your physical uh, exhibition. And that brings my presentation of Imprimo to an end. Very shortly, as we continue to build a partnership with Partial, you will be able to buy, to sell your work directly on Partial. There'll be a button here called Buy Now. The second you press that, it'll be transported over um, to Partial and be able to, 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 to sell your work there. There'll be a series of different integrations that are coming. Uh, you'll see a lot more of the information you have on Imprimo will be transported um, over to Partial. So we're really excited about that. It's coming soon. Uh, so stay tuned over the coming months as we share more of these news. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will open it up to Tammy, uh, which will tell us a little bit more about Partial and take us through how their platform works. Great. Okay. I hope everyone can see that. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try and keep this uh, straightforward because I know that we are running out of time and I know there are quite a few questions from folks, but um, the website is partial.gallery. So I invite um, everyone here to explore this. We update the homepage as often as we can to try and spotlight different pro artists and new artists. Um, whenever possible. 
There is the artwork page, which showcases um, the available artwork that is on partial um, with different ways to browse. So yeah, take your time, explore. We divide them into collections. We, uh, amongst our small team, we try our best to highlight as many different artists as possible. Um, there's different services here. Yeah, poke around, enjoy. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. But I think I'm going to just go straight into um, the stuff that's behind the scenes uh, that maybe the public doesn't necessarily see so that for any artists who aren't familiar with Partial, you can kind of get a sense of how it all works. But we have here an example of um, an artist profile page, which is publicly viewable. And you can see how there is space for a bio and a CV, but more importantly, there is work as well with pricing visible for folks. So um, that's something that when we started Partial many years ago, that wasn't a very common thing to display pricing. And again, when we think about accessibility for folks who are wondering if they can afford a piece, this really very quickly makes it clear to them um, what something might cost. So we have here, for example, with Helio's example, um, the purchase price and then also a rental price per month. Um, let me see if I use one of these as an example. Let's choose this one. So here he's a photographer um, and we've used different things here. I think I saw in the chat someone was asking about photos and I think Mina was able to answer that, but um, this is his explanation about his art piece. We talk a little bit about shipping and availability here. And we have this um, technology called Wallspacer AR, which actually allows somebody with a smartphone to scan this and be able to render the piece um, on a blank wall in their space to really further uh, make it easier for people to imagine that piece in their space. So again, always thinking about ways to, to make it a little bit easier, a little bit easier, a little bit easier for folks to invest in an art piece um, by an artist in Canada. So there's that. And now what I wanted to take folks into was actually what it looks like in the booking side of things. So um, I have here a chat with an artist who's on partial named Shailaja. And I think she actually might be in, she was here earlier in this room. I'm not sure if she's still here, but um, with her permission, I was able to share kind of our, an example of uh, our communication. So this is for this piece that I have hanging behind me, very strategically placed. And um, I wanted to show how this is different from, I guess, a an out of the box e-commerce experience. This is something that Partial worked really hard on, again, to try and replicate all the nuances that come along with trying to sell and ship or deliver or arrange a pickup of an art piece. So the first thing that happens is an artwork request would go in. So this is me looking at it from an art buyer perspective. So when I submit my interest for renting or buying a piece, the artist then gets a notification. And we added that step in because again, knowing that artists sort of maybe juggling different avenues, whether it is, hey, maybe they have paintings on partial um, that happen to be in a show or that are on loan somewhere or perhaps have been sold elsewhere or whatever. We wanted to give artists that opportunity to approve and acknowledge that the piece was in fact available before progressing into the um, purchase stage. So it says here, um, my purchase request for this painting has been sent to the artist. And then at that point, the artist um, can approve the piece. And then when that happens, I as an art collector um, get the chance to talk about whether I want to do a pickup or a delivery. And as soon as a request is sent, a chat is opened here between the artist and the art collector. So here you can see my message here where I was like, oh, I see this painting, but I wanna get a sense of um, what the back of it looks like because I didn't see a photo of it on the product page. So um, Shailaja, I wanted to again, use her as a great example because she was really communicative um, and was really like comfortable collaborating to explain and make sure that the art buyer was comfortable with what they were going to get. So she was really clear about her like schedule, um, the condition of the painting, et cetera, et cetera. So all through this time, we have this chat 
um, so I'm also like now building a relationship with the artist and vice versa. The artist is building a relationship with the prospective art buyer. Then it goes into payment. So as an art buyer, I can process my payment securely through partial with any major credit card. And in there would also be a, um, a small fee for insurance protection. And as well, there are any fees that, um, the artist would want to add in during our conversation. So perhaps if we're talking about delivery, there's the opportunity before I submit payment for um, Shailaja to put in a cost for delivery. If she's going to be delivering it in person out of town, if she's going to be shipping it, um, perhaps maybe we talk about framing and the artist has offered to frame it for a cost of $200. That's also something that she can then charge into that before I submit payment. And then at this stage, I've paid and uh, the artist is notified. And at that point, then the um, delivery or pickup of the art piece can go ahead. And then as an art buyer, I now then this is my final step here. So um, that's a little insight as to how a booking chat would work and then that continues to live in the bookings here so that the communication can stay open between the two and it's been really interesting to see how um you know oftentimes i think like that in person building uh between the artist and the art buyer we have incidents or instances rather of folks you know turning into repeat buyers for a particular artists once that relationship has started to develop so i think that's really interesting and we really wanted to give people a chance to connect that way as opposed to just like enter in a credit card and go. So um, so that's the insight onto how a booking works. And uh, for everyone's interest, this is Shailaja's artist profile on Partial. And now I think I will actually stop sharing and I'm going to pass the mic over to Mina. So Mina heads up um, community engagement and artist success, and she'll be able to do a little behind the scenes view of what an artist dashboard actually looks like. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I'm just going to quickly share my screen with you all. Um, all right, so I'm assuming you all can see this. Uh, okay, um, so here's a quick um, overview at the artist dashboard. Um, a lot of what I guess I'll be touching on in this portion of the talk has already been um, kind of mentioned uh, by Tammy, Linz, and April. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to be highlighting some of the features that you could use to optimize um, your artist workflow and your business as an artist. So for starters, we have the insights tab, which gives you um, an overview of your impressions uh, from year to date, as well as the number of profile visits. And you can see it all laid out on this graph. Uh, this is really nice because you could kind of get a feel for, um, let's say like, for instance, this is a test um, profile. And so likely your um, insights won't be totally plateauing like this one, but, um, in May of 2021, we have a spike in views. And so let's say that that month you were featured, you had a homepage feature on partial, and we also did like a blog post feature or something like that. And so that's where you're seeing the influx in traffic. And then the following month, June of 2021, um, let's say summer tends to be like a slower time for commerce people tend to be like on vacation kind of like going out and doing things in the real world and so um having the ability to sort of track your traffic can be really helpful to inform your marketing strategy um and so you might decide that seeing that in the last couple of years maybe um you notice that there is like um a downturn in profile visits in the summer that might be an indication to you that this year you want to up your marketing strategy and focus on um, getting your work out there through like different avenues or trying out different things. So um, yeah, that's a quick look at the overview. Um, and when you click artwork, you can also see the individual views for each of your pieces. Um, so 
there they are. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna go to my account. So this is where you kind of fill out like the framework of your profile. Um, so Tammy had shown um, Helio's profile as an example. And so this is kind of where you just input all that good stuff. Uh, so your bio, your profile picture. We also have a questionnaire portion, which um, I always recommend artists to fill out um, because artist bios tend to be quite concise, which is a great thing and quite formal. Um, I find that at times it's sort of hard to get a grasp of the artist or like the personality of the artist um, or the person behind the work, so to speak. Um, and you can really get a sense of that in this portion. So you have the, abil the ability to pick from six different questions. There's a drop down menu here um, and you can just choose whatever you want to answer. But yeah, this is a really fun section. Um, similarly, we also have the in the studio portion which I know Imprimo has as well, that's quite similar to this. Uh, this is just a place where you can dump images of you at your studio, um, any sort of like behind the scenes content, all of this stuff kind of helps people get a feel for like what goes into your work um, and also your process, which is really, really interesting. And I think can get lost in just simply viewing like the final product. Um, and so, yeah, this is another, uh, really, I would say, key um, portion of your profile to sort of pay attention to when you're filling it out. Um, next up, we have the artworks portion. So in here, you can um, add artworks as well as reorder them, which is really nice. Let's say, for example, you're a photographer and you shoot both black and white and color images and you want to kind of like lay that out accordingly so that you have like one row black and white, one row color. You could easily do that by clicking this button and just rearranging your pieces. Um, so I'll click on blue triangle to give you guys a feel for sort of the back end of an artwork listing. So um, in here, of course, you'll upload all of your images. Uh, we always recommend uploading as much or as many relevant images as possible. Um, because this is like an online viewing of your work, it can be hard to get a sense of, I guess, like the magnitude of it or um, this, these sort of little nuances and details that you would otherwise easily pick up on in person, which is why it's so important to take as many detailed shots as you can. Um, for the first image, which is start over here, this is your thumbnail image, as well as the image that's used for the wall space or augmented reality feature um, that Tammy had mentioned earlier. So uh, for this image, we ask that you just use a straight on image of the work with no edges showing, but then you can add as many images as you want of like uh, different angles um, of the piece. So there's that as well as all the sort of like artwork information that would be necessary or that would be relevant for the piece. Um, and then we have your details portion. So um, of, of course, including as many details as possible um, just helps people get a better sense of the piece. Uh, so you can include um, a little bit about the piece, a little bit about your process. Uh, for Blue Triangle, we wrote that this piece was produced during um, the artist time in Chicago at a residency. We also mentioned the type of paper it was printed on and the process of printing uh, which it was made. So um, yeah, you can also include like inspirations, anything really, what you were thinking at the time, what you were feeling, all of that is really, really interesting. Um, and worth mentioning. So you've got that. We also have over here just a checklist of uh, relevant things you can tick off. Uh, so like if it's ready to hang, if it's framed, um, that's all really useful information to know. And of course you can include where it's been, um, which shows it's been a part of, and your tag. So this is for search engine purposes. Let's say I'm a collector and I'm looking for a minimalist, orange, ready to hang piece of artwork. If you're using the relevant tags, it'll be easy to find. So that's what that is over here. 
uh, and lastly, so this is our pricing guide. Um, now this is available for our pro members, but essentially what this does is it averages the prices of artwork on partial with the same dimensions, medium and type as your piece and it gives you the price over here. So um, there are so many different ways to approach pricing your work. I know that there is different formulas. I think Linz had mentioned one. Um, you could also do like, yeah, you could just figure out, there's so many like different ways to approach this, but this tool is really nice because you can kind of just get a sense of what people working similarly have their work priced at. Um, so there's that. And then we also have the rental marketplace that you can opt into if you are a pro member. Um, again, this is something that Tammy had touched on, but what's great about this program is um, it's a rent to own program. So um, if a person rents your piece for the three months, decides that they love it, the rental price that was already paid will go towards the purchase of the piece. And I wanna say that there's um, about like a 65% conversion rate for uh, rentals to purchases. So this is a really great, um, a really great, uh, I guess, option that you could try out if that's something that you'd be open to. Um, we also have trade access for our pro members. And what that entails is just shorter term rentals for people working in um, trade industries. So uh, you have uh, film and TV, uh, the film and TV rental, which is for a week. Um, and then we have a month rental, which is for people, which is for like interior designers, stagers, realtors, that kind of thing. And you can always um, adjust your price accordingly um, over here. Um, and yeah, you have also the ability to update your artwork status. So let's say uh, one of your pieces was just selected for a show and it won't be available for the next two months. You can just go in here, um, click unavailable. And so it'll still be viewable on your profile, but people won't be able to book it um, and you can always change the status as needed. But um, yeah, that's uh, the general gist of it. I would encourage all of you to uh, go in and play around with your profile if you are an artist on partial or um, if you're applying, if you do get in, this is something that, um, yeah, I would just take the time to like go over everything. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us and um, we'd love to help. But just for the sake of time, I wanted to keep this as short and concise as possible. Thanks, Mina. Thanks, Sammy. That was great. There's a ton of questions about partial in the chat. Uh, I know you guys have tried to answer as many as possible. What is the best way for people to reach you if they have questions about partial? Um, they can reach me at Mina at partial dot gallery. Um, that's the easiest way, I guess, if you're an artist just looking for some guidance or some assistance. I'm always available for one on one calls if that's something that people are interested in. So, um, yes, that's the Amazing. easiest way. Great. And for those of you who got a question about Imprimo, info at Imprimo.ca, we'd be thrilled to answer all your questions. Um, as a thank you to everybody who's been with us for the last couple hours uh, and listened to our, our panel, we're really thankful for all of you. Again, it's the most attended events that we have so far. We're running a promotion for the next 24 hours. So if you're on this call today and you're not a, you're not as part of Imprimo, if you join info at Imprimo.ca forward slash sign up, uh, we'll give you your first 90 days free on us. You can simply sign up and it will be automatically added within 48 hours to your account. So uh, if you're not an Imprimo member and you want to try it out, uh, info at imprimo.ca forward slash sign up. Uh, your first 90 days are on us. 